Good morning, everyone. This is Jenny Lyles. I'm out of my mind, and we are in Independence, Missouri this morning on a very wet and cool day. Uh, today we're going to be talking about executive function and habit building and how you can move things from your prefrontal cortex, which is where your executive function lives, to your basal ganglia, which I also call your lizard brain, and other parts of your brain where habit lives, and how to distinguish the use of these different parts of your brain. Um, some announcements before I start. Uh, this here is a postcard that I got from this lovely book here, Color Yourself Zen Postcards, 50 Tranquil pa Passages to Color and Share. It's by Lisa Mangano and Charlotte Legree. And the one I'm doing now has a pattern of what appears to be something like fern leaves, and I am going to be coloring it using the palette of pens that I'm showing right now, red, orange, dark yellow, a couple, three different greens, a very pale yellow, a brown, and kind of a gold are going to be the colors I'm playing with. Now the reason I'm showing you these postcards, and I'm showing you two more, one that's got a paisley pattern and the other is a pattern of lines that are vaguely plant-like but that I did in kind of riotous colors, are because these are the hand-colored postcards that if you go to my Patreon at patreon.com backslash J-L-I-L-E-S that I will send to people who support me at the $5 level or above. Um, as a reminder, half of every penny I make through this writing and video casting and podcasting will go to my best friend, Kathy Malone, as a donation toward raising the money for her to have a new heart and have the anti-rejection meds that she needs to stay alive after her new heart. And this will continue until she gets her new heart. And after that, out of the first $1,000 I get every month, she will get up to $500 to cover her anti-rejection meds for as long as she lives. Um, one last final note before we start. I will be migrating the Out of My Mind website, which is currently at outofmymind.org responsive llc.com which is a subdomain of my main business site to its own domain which i just bought yesterday which is oomm.live can't get much shorter than that oomm.live okay now i'm going to do what i've done in the past and i'm going to give you a brief screenshot it looks like I'm going to have to do it in two parts. So we're going to do the top part here of executive function versus habit. Um, and some of the notes I made in preparation for this. And then here's the bottom half. So that if you want to have this visual to go along with the uh, things I'm talking about today, you will have it. I will also be writing an article when it goes on to the website after the three-day Patreon time period. All right, like we talked about before, and I'm going to start this because I think it's fall, so we're going to have fall colors on these fern-like leaves here. After we start this out of my mind um, video cast about executive function, Okay, I lost my train of thought there, guys. Sorry about that. Let's try again. Executive function is non-automatic, directed thought that manipulates things and requires work. And as you can tell, I lost my executive function there for a moment, which is one of the reasons I'm going into habit today, which does not rely on executive function. Habit relies on an older part of your brain, the basal ganglia, which is almost the oldest part of our brains entirely. It is the part where fear lives. It is the part where nightmares live. And oddly enough, it is also the part of your brain where habit lives. Now, executive function is the newest part of your brain genetically 
when um, when I say that there are only a couple of species of animal that have the developed prefrontal cortexes that we do. Uh, some of the great apes do. Homo neanderthalus did back in his day, or her day if you prefer. Um, and that is where that higher reasoning lives. And it is not a common part of the brain to most other animals. And therefore, it is kind of like the canary in the coal mine that goes wrong when things are going wrong in your life. So we don't want to rely on that if we have a lot of mental health stuff going on, if we have a lot of stress going on. What we want to do is develop habits that will serve us well when our mental health isn't as strong as we'd like. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, again, we've got the ape brain versus the lizard brain. We've got the back brain versus the front brain. We have a genetically new part of our brain versus a genetically old part of our brain. We have higher reasoning and effortful thinking that requires effort and concentration versus something that becomes virtually effortless. But how do we form habits? Now see, that's a little tougher. Um, there's been a lot of research on it. A lot of it comes from the business world because the business world is invested in people who have good habits. Um, a recent book came out by a gentleman by the name of Charles Duhigg, D-U-H-I-G-G. Uh, he is a business writer, not a psychologist, not a scientist. However, he is a very good researcher regardless. And he wrote a book about how to develop habits. Um, its name is its off the top of my head, and I left it out of my notes, so it will be in the final draft of all this, guys. He says that there are three things you need to develop in order to develop a long-standing habit. You need to have a trigger for the habit. You need to develop a pattern of repeating the same behavior over and over. And you need to have some reward for that behavior. As we all know, habits can be good or bad. And I bet you can think of things that are bad habits. Substance abuse is a good example. You can think of what triggers substance abuse. You can think of what the behavior is that is repeated over and over. And you can think about what the reward is. But that's not what we're after today. We are after good habits that serve us well when we are struggling to exercise our executive function. Those of us who are what we call high-functioning people with mental health issues and or, in my case, organic brand, brain damage, have to rely on this stuff quite a bit because our executive function doesn't work the way it does in people who have not had brain damage, who have not had organic issues with their brain or severe trauma that has changed the way their brain works. Let's start first with a trigger. Um, this goes back to when we were talking about executive function, we were talking one of the things we brought up was um, task initiation and how difficult that can be for somebody with executive function problems. And especially when we're talking about something called the impossible task that becomes terrifying and very difficult to start. Task initiation requires a trigger. So if you're trying to develop a habit, you're going to have to ask yourself, what do I need to do to start this behavior every time I am wanting to do it? And your answer is going to be your trigger. Now, uh, some of you may be aware that I am not happy with my body right now. I have what I call a stress ball in my belly, which is that I've been retaining body weight in my belly for approximately the last two years which is unusual for me. I tend to develop it in my hips. And as somebody who knows anything about the way the body stores fat knows, hips are healthier than belly, and I want to get rid of that belly fat. But as we also know, targeted 
uh, loss of weight doesn't necessarily get rid of it in one area and the other. The reason I am gaining weight in my belly is because I have high stress, but I will have to exercise and diet for my whole body to lose weight in that belly. And I want to lose the weight not because I'm vain. Come on, guys, I'm 52 years old. I'm not as pretty as I'm used to be, and I'm kind of okay with that. Um, but it's because body weight stored in your belly leads to poor outcomes such as heart disease, such as uh, stroke, high blood pressure, and I don't want any of those things. And I have a family history of diabetes, so this is kind of important to me. I want to join a gym and exercise every day and work to keep my sugar habit under control. Those are all pretty reasonable goals, and I'm telling you this as examples of the kind of goals that require habit changes. So I am fortunate in that I live in a town that has a community gym that costs approximately $65 a year for uh, city residents who can prove that on their ID that they live within city limits to join. And I am going to later this week walk over to the gym, which is a very short walk from my office. I'm not doing it today because I'm a baby and it's raining. Um, but I am going to go over there and I'm going to pay my $65 and then I'm going to start exercising. And that is going to be an easy thing to do because I'm going to be triggered by a nice day with about a half hour time or possibly 45 minutes when I have time to walk over there pay my dues and come back to my office before my next client. So that's an easy one, but we're talking about a habit now. Now, how am I going to get in the habit of exercising every day? Well, this particular community center opens at six o'clock in the morning, which works for me because I like to get up and exercise early before I do anything else, before I lose my nerve. So I am going to start setting my alarm for roughly 545 in the morning and then I am going to lay out the night before I go to bed. I am going to lay out, oh, I'm looking forward to this color. What's the wrong one? Looking forward to this color because it's so pretty. Uh, I'm going to lay out my clothes the night before. See what I mean? What a satisfying, pretty color, that dark, dark red. We can pretend this is a maple leaf or perhaps poison ivy. Yes, they turn a beautiful, lovely red. That's the one good thing about poison ivy is it's fall colors. So I'm going to set that trigger for myself to already have my clothes ready to go, my socks, my shoes, my underwear, my sports bra, all that fun stuff. And so when I get up first thing in the morning before I have my coffee, after I fed my dog and cat, I will take off for the gym. Um, I've done this in the past, and it worked really well for me, so I have that going for me. The next part, after setting that trigger, is developing the habit. And we have a lot of disinformation, um, not so much lies as poorly researched material that comes in habit formation. We have been told for a long time, and this is professionals as well as lay people, have been told that it takes 21 days to form a new habit. And that number is wrong. It comes from a gentleman by the name of Malcolm Maltz, who was a plastic surgeon, who in the 1950s decided to observe how long it took him to develop a habit. And he found that for him, it typically took approximately 21 days to develop a habit. Well, the problem with that is Malcolm was a high achiever, probably somebody who had naturally high executive function, and he didn't have a decent control, and because of that, his numbers were off. They were off considerably. Uh, the actual amount of time, according to a researcher by the name of Philippa Lally, uh, in 2009, when she took a larger cross-section of people and figured out how long it was going to take them to develop a habit by do doing it every day, is 66 days. 
Now, 66 days and 21 days are very different numbers. One is over two months, one is under one. It feels great to imagine that we can develop a new habit in 21 days, but guys, I'm here to tell you that you're going to have to work harder than that for longer than that. So, when I go to exercise, I am going to promise myself that for 66 days... I am going to go no less than three times a week and no more than five times a week because, as you know, we need rest days when we work on our bodies, especially when you're old like I am. And I am going to go to the gym and I am going to spend starting with probably 10 or 15 minutes on an elliptical and eventually expanding that to 30 minutes. And then starting with maybe 10 or 15 minutes on the various Nautilus machines, of course, rotating out between top and body. And then going to a half hour of that. And beginning and ending my exercise time with a little time on the mats doing sun salutes and other yoga poses for flexibility. So that is probably how I'm going to do it. I am not a physical trainer. I don't recommend you necessarily follow my particular routine. That's just something that I find both fun and workable for me. So that is how I am going to do my exercising. And so when you're developing a hot habit, you notice I didn't say for that for 66 days I was going to go every day. Because for some habits, you don't want to do them every day. And exercise can be one of those things. Um, eventually, I may get to the point where going to the gym every day is a thing. But to start with, it would probably overwhelm me and probably not be healthy for my arthritis, which is going to need some downtime after each attempt for me to recover. So, the final piece of this is the reward. Now, I've had pretty significant arthritis. Ooh, is that a hair? It is. I'm a blondie and I shed, guys. Anyway, uh, I have had pretty significant arthritis since my mid-30s. It runs in my family, and I seem to be the one of my siblings that got it worst from my mother. And so, even though I enjoy exercise after I'm done... The actual process of exercising can be incredibly painful for me because I'm having to work with the osteoarthritis that is fairly severe, starting in my spine, going down to my hands and ankles and other parts of my body radiating out. So exercise itself is not intrinsically, internally rewarding to me because, guys, it hurts. So I have to come out. And we, this goes back again to uh, ways to hack your brain to do executive function. I have to go to external rewards to trick myself into exercising. And a couple of the things that have worked for me in the past are to have an ebook um, in front of me while I'm on the elliptical so that I am listening to. Um, music, usually something with a decent beat that goes along with how fast I want to be walking. In fact, I usually set up a playlist that has approximately the tempo that I'm looking for. And then I am going to have, on top of that, it's probably too close to the same color there, but that's okay. I'm going to have, on top of that, um, an audio book for when I'm lifting weights because that's kind of a different tempo. And so I can listen to something inspiring or I can listen to uh, a book that I enjoy or, you know, Welcome to Night Vale, which is one of the best cod podcasts ever, or something like that that will distract me from the fact that I'm feeling pain. And then, of course, when I go home, after about a half hour, I start feeling really good for the rest of the day. And so I really enjoy exercising after I'm done, but getting in there is really hard for me. So let's go back. We have a trigger. In my case, this would be setting out my clothes and being ready to go. 
we have a habit formation. This would be to go to the gym, and I would probably set specific days. Like I would go to the gym on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday one week, and the following week I would go on Sunday, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And I would rotate these out. So I'm basically going every other day to the gym in order to develop a habit of going to the gym on a regular basis. And then finally, I would give myself an external reward while I'm working out or of listening to an e uh, audiobook that I enjoy or music that I enjoy or reading an ebook while working on the elliptical. And the reason I do elliptical, guys, is because I'm a klutz and I have never successfully used a treadmill in my life. And I am not willing to learn at this late stage of my life. So, imagine for yourself, I want you to think of a goal you have that you would really like to achieve that's going to require some work, a habit that you're trying to build. What could be the trigger? Could it be something like opening your computer? Could it be something like an alarm on your phone? Could it be something like uh, the sun coming up in the morning or the sun going down at night? Could it be something like walking into a particular room or walking out of a particular room? Think about what your trigger is and what will work for you because what works for you is not necessarily going to be the same thing that works for me. So you're going to have to come up with some things that are a little different for you as compared to me. Now I want you to go to your habit. Is this something that you can do every day? Is it a weekly thing? Is it a monthly thing? How are you going to set this habit in your life? Um, what are you going to do to make sure that you make room in your life for this habit? Um, just out of interest, I used to go to a gym that was all the way across the city from me. And Independence is not a huge population city, but it is a broad area city. And when I say across the city from me, I mean it took 25 minutes to get from my house to the gym. And then another 25 minutes to get to the from the gym to my work following my workout. Now, the community center that I am changing to, first of all, is enormously cheaper, and that is definitely a motive, but it also only takes five minutes to get to from my house. And it takes less than five minutes to get to from my office. So it's just about perfect in terms of having no downsides with regard to how far it is and how difficult it is for me to access it. Well, so keep that in mind when you're developing your habit. It's going to be something in the way of that habit that you can work around by changing where you're going to do the thing or changing what time of day or changing who you do it with. Remember when we talked about partnering in the last video? So is there somebody, um, when I first started exercising, it was Kathy that got me exercising, my best friend Kathy. She was the one who convinced me because she needed a workout partner because her doctor had ordered her to do aerobic work um, because we were trying to avoid back in those days the transplant that she needs now. And so, he was trying to get her to exercise more regularly, and so I started exercising partially to help her, and that partnering helped quite a bit because I didn't want to let her down when she was going to be in the gym, and vice versa. So, and what is going to be your reward? Remember, we have intrinsic awards. Oh, this feels good. I enjoy doing it. That's an intrinsic reward. And we have extrinsic rewards. Oh, I'm going to listen to my music. I'm going to go when I'm done. And I'm going to get myself a Starbucks coffee, if that's what you like. If you like that overly dark burnt coffee, you are welcome to it. But for me, that is not a reward. I might drink their chai, but I won't drink their coffee. In any case, um, it is a reward that works for you, not one that works for me. 
Now, executive function catches new information, information you didn't have before. Um, I'm learning how to do what's called hand lettering. You see that I'm using these Tombow dual marker things. Learning how to do hand lettering doesn't come naturally to me. I have kind of a sloppy handwriting. I am not anybody's idea of a great artist. But knowing how to hold a pen and all that stuff is stuff that you learn when you're learning new stuff in order to learn how to do hand lettering, which I'm not going to demonstrate to you today. But it's just an example of some new learning that I'm using executive function to learn and I'm concentrating on. Um, it catches that new information and then with any success, it is going to pass that information on to your basal ganglia and other parts of your brain that help you retain that information and use it. It's kind of like the difference between, let's say you're in fifth grade and this kid has just been mean to you and you're really tired of this kid being mean to you and you know you're not supposed to hit people, but you go ahead and hit this kid anyway because you are just sick and tired of their stuff. And that's your executive function that knows it's wrong to hit this person. But you weren't able to get in the habit of effectively fighting this bully without using your fists. So it hadn't gotten to the habit formation part. It wasn't part of your basal ganglia to know that it's more effective to make this person feel foolish for targeting you, for to... Uh, ask an adult to step in to do things that are going to make it not worth the bully's time to pick on you, right? So when we set that stuff into the habit formation stuff, it becomes what's called second nature. It becomes easy for us. It's no longer, longer thoughtful. It's no longer purposeful. It's something we do for the fun of it, something we do that feels very relaxing. For me, writing is almost not an executive function thing anymore because I have been doing it so long for so many times that I know how to start an essay. I know how to start a poem. I know how to start um, a short story incredibly well. I'm really good at this stuff, right? Finishing it, not always so much, but I know how to start it. And so for me, Writing is almost a habit. In fact, some of my best writing comes when I am in a state of mind where I can't think deeply because the stuff I'm thinking about is already deeply in there in the habit centers. Finally, we're going to do a little exercise here. I am going to name uh, about a half dozen or so different things that your brain can do and I'm going to name them as a list, and then we're going to go back and talk about whether they are an executive function or a habit or a little bit of both. You ready? Okay. Let's start with learning Mandarin Chinese, which has been a goal of mine for a lot of years. It's kind of hard to do. I don't have a lot of access to it. Is that executive function or is that habit forming to learn a language that's very different than your birth language um, and be able to speak, write, and hear it. Okay? The next is walking your dog every day, rain or shine. Do I need more green, maybe? I think I do. Um, getting up every single morning, putting the leash on your dog, and walking out that front door, grabbing an umbrella or a warm coat if you need it, and going for a walk. Which is that executive function or is that a habit? What about, um, let's say one of your favorite foods is a certain brand of yogurt, maybe one of those really popular um, Greek yogurts, right? And at your favorite store, you know they carry that yogurt. Is going to get that yogurt at your favorite store something that you're using your executive function for, your habit abilities for, or something of both of them? 
Now imagine that instead of yogurt, which you're very used to and you've had a lot of times, you're going to go get some... Mm, Dora Wat, which is Ethiopian food. It's a stew that has chicken in it. And you've never had Dora Wat, but you've heard that a new grocery store that you've never been in carries a kit to help you make Dora Wat, including the injera that is almost impossible for a layperson to make. I know I've tried and I'm a pretty good cook and I have Ethiopian relatives that attempted to teach me. So you're going to the grocery store to get Dora Wat and injera. And is this going to be using the habit parts of your brain or is this going to be using executive function? Now, I want you to imagine that I am sitting down here and I'm teaching you how to knit. I'm teaching you how to cast on. I'm teaching you how to do the knit stitch. I am teaching you how to do the purl stitch. I am teaching you how to do a slip stitch. I am teaching you how to do a yarn over. I am teaching you how to do an increase and I am teaching you how to do a decrease. These are, by the way, pretty much everything that is involved in knitting at every level. Now I tell you this and now I'm going to ask you another question. Um, is that learning how to knit, is that going to involve executive function or is it going to involve habit? Now let's say I've taught you how to knit. We're all done with that piece of it. And you are knitting a uh, pattern called Granny's Favorite Face Cloth, which by the way is available on Ravelry. I did not write it, but it is my favorite washcloth pattern. It is a simple garter stitch pattern, and frankly, I think it's the easiest thing to teach somebody to knit with. It involves the knit stitch only. It involves increases and decreases, and a very short run of cast-ons and a very short run of cast-offs, depending. It can be around four stitches at each part. So is that going to be predominantly habit, predominantly uh, executive function, or a combination of the two. And finally, let's say that instead of doing that nifty little grandma's face cloth pattern, I'm giving you a pattern to do for an intricate Aran sweater, which is made of cables and lots of different stitches all through it. It's those ones that you see that are sometimes called fisherman uh, sweaters that have lots and lots of different intricate patterns all over, usually in one color, but very, very bubbly and nubbly and lots and lots of braids and stuff like that. Is that going to be predominantly executive function or is that going to be predominantly habit? Okay, going back through those exercises, language learning is almost exclusively executive function. It requires you to hold things in working memory and manipulate them, get rid of extraneous distractions, including impulses, all those things that executive function is used for. Uh, taking your dog for a walk is pretty obviously a habit that you're working to get into. So you're working to get any knowledge that you didn't have necessary to take your dog for a walk. Perhaps learning how to train your dog might be a piece there. Um, that then takes your dog for a walk every day. So you're going to want to concentrate on a trigger, on a habit formation, and on an internal or external reward. Buying your favorite food at your favorite grocery store is all solidly habit. You don't need to think hard about this. You know the store, you know where in the store your favorite food is, you know approximately how much it costs, and you probably even know what the person who's checking you out looks like if you don't know their name. Now, going to a new grocery store for a food you've never had before, by the way, Dora Watt is amazingly delicious, and if you'd rather have something that's vegan because that's the way you roll, Ethiopian food also has a lot of vegan options, including Miser Watt, which is made of red lentils. And um, if I told you red lentils are one of my favorite foods in the world, you would probably look at me funny unless you've had Miser Watt. Anyway, and I probably pronounced it wrong. My apologies to my cousin, Bacala. Anyway, 
So going into a store you've never been in before, you're going to have to use some executive function. Now let's see, this is a stew. Would it be in the stews? This has got chicken in it. Would, be, would it be in with the meats? Well, gee, it has this kind of bread-like thing, which is really basically a large, delicious sourdough pancake. Would it be in with the breads? Or would it be in with the prepared foods? So you have to think about these things. Do I have all the leaves done? Nope, I have a couple more to do. That one needs to be green. I think I'm going to do the pale green up here. Um, and the knitting, learning to knit is very definitely executive function. It can be as challenging in some ways as um, similar mathematical exercises that aren't um, being devoted to muscle memory. Doing a simple pattern like the Granny's um, Knit Face Cloth is going to be habit because once that's in your muscle memory, you can do a pattern like that without thinking or blinking. It's pretty awesome, actually, what you can do with a good knit pattern in terms of having it be a habit. Now, doing an Aran sweater, I don't care how talented a knitter you are, you are not committing all of the patterns in an Aran sweater sweater completely to memory. You are going to have to use at least a mixture of executive function and habit. You're going to have that muscle memory that is habit. You're going to have the I know what a knit stitch feels like to do and looks like to do. I know what a purl stitch looks like. I know how to use a cable. Um, a cable, I know how to make a cable which is uses what's called a cable hook which is the word I was trying to capture. And so that gives you an idea. Well, while we were working on this, I have nearly f finished my third of my postcards. It says, don't predict the future, invent it. Um, I'm going to be outlining each of these leaves in a contrasting color. And then in between all of this, it is going to be a lovely pale blue that I pulled out later. And then I'm going to do something neat because I have a blending pen that's going to take the interiors of each of these leaves and blend them into the exteriors a little bit. Which I do for fun because whatever. Thank you so much for hanging out for me with me for lo these, oh my goodness, way too long, 37 minutes. And my special thanks to Jean Rosner, who came up with the name out of my mind. My friends and family, especially my husband, Jason, who finally got approved for disability. Yay. And my sons, Ryan and Sean, my daughter-in-law, Liz, who is like a daughter to me, and all my other kids in the heart. Those who have joined my out of my mind Facebook group, Facebook group that is for people who want to work on mental health things from a social justice perspective. And it is more a discussion group than a support group, although it is labeled a support group. You are welcome to join. You can find the link on my responsive LLC page at Facebook or on my, my uh, website. My Patreon sponsors, thank you so much. My special thanks to Missy Pratt, uh, to Marcy Pine and to Gail Morse, all three of whom are donating at the $5 or above thing. You are each getting a postcard and I am almost done all three. My best friend Kathy Malone is still trying to raise money for her anti-rejection meds. You can find a link to donate directly to her at the bottom of every article I write on my website, which will soon be available by going to oomm.live, and you will be able to find that link at the bottom of any article on that website. Thank you again. I will see you in a few days. We'll have at least one more article about executive function. I think it's time to talk about executive function and um, societal and community things. And then I will move on to another topic. And my next topic after executive function um, comes from an old game. It's the Mary... Uh, why am I forgetting these words? Mary Shag Kill Game, and it's on relationship triage. And that should be a much shorter video, but I look forward to it because it sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. 
thank you all. This is me waving. Maybe it should be like this. And I will see you again very soon, or you will see me, or at least my hands. Thank you.